After threatening a false sexual misconduct case against me, he wants to be my boyfriend. He was back in my life. When his dad had beaten me black and blue right in front of him, he stayed silent and whimpered like a little babe in the corner. When his dad had threatened me with a false sexual misconduct case against me, all the while calling me a dirty fag, he stayed silent. Now, he wanted me back. Desperately, he said. One could argue it happened years ago. And, well, it wasn't actually George who'd done that, right? So... It should be easy to forgive him, and to move past all the hurt and pain. But it wasn't so easy. Years ago, when I was still living in the small town that I'd been conceived and brought up in, I had come out as the first openly gay man in the entire town, even though I knew a bunch of gay men spread throughout the town. It hadn't been an easy pill to swallow for most of the townspeople. But, some had taken an intrigue in the extraordinary courage that I displayed. One such fellow was George, two years my junior. He lived two doors down where I lived, and we were quite good friends at the school. I'd helped him with his studies on several occasions, and taken great pride each time he scored the best in his school. Because we were already so close, he had immediately sought me out. In the next few weeks, He confessed that he wanted to check if he was attracted to men and was sure that he wanted to understand what it all meant and felt. Naturally, he found the best solution in me. Stupidly, I had entertained his whims. We kissed. Then again, and again, and again. A few weeks went by like that, and although it all started with a kiss, it sure helped us in bringing us together. Things looked good, until his dad caught us kissing. Sean, George's dad, was the town sheriff, and had a considerable influence over the town's politics. So, when he found us, and started beating me, his eyes rage-filled and his nose flaring in madness, I knew things would not end well for me. George's silence, as he stood in the corner, hurt me more than Sean's beating, though. When Sean stopped, I promised that I wasn't forcing myself on his son. It was consensual. I I still remember saying those three words, but when Sean turned around to ask George the same thing, he'd remained mum. Taking his silence as an agreement to his own preconceived notions about me, he grabbed me by my neck and dragged me into his jeep. Before I knew it, I was locked up in jail. It was only because of my dad that he let me out. My dad begged me to leave the town, and so I did. George and I never interacted after that until now. He was standing at the doorway, blocking my exit. The school hours had long finished, and I could feel an oncoming headache. George had grown taller and broader over the past years. He carried this faint stubble that I remember running my hand over all those years back. It was almost funny that now I wanted to punch him in the face. After his dad had forced me out of the town, I had nothing left on my name. I had to leave my college studies in the middle and was forced to find work. My dad couldn't support me a lot and that was how I found a job here at this high school. As a janitor of all things. Desperate as I was, I accepted it. The pay was not brilliant, but it was okay. I could rent out a decent enough home at this pay and send the remaining money to my dad in the town and still be left with something. But now that George was standing in front of me as a teacher, I couldn't help but feel shame. I could have been something better too, had it not been for his dad. Get the hell out of my way. Can we talk? Please, Ronnie. I have missed you. You're an absurd man, George. I want to punch you in the face. I seethed, balling my hands into a tight fist. If push came to shove, I knew he would win it. I looked like a midget in front of him, but that didn't mean I wasn't going to do some serious damage if I got the chance. Leave me alone. You've done enough. He closed his eyes for a second. I want to apologize for it. Well, I replied dryly, is your dad fucking dead yet? That's the only way you could apologize. 
he let out a small laugh, and it sounded like a scoff. Soon, he will be dead soon, though. His tone sounded so ignorant and careless that I wondered if things were well between them. George didn't look like he cared for his dad much. Honestly, if I had a dad like Sean, I wouldn't care for him either. But I didn't care for the implications or what happened with Sean. I just wanted to get away from him. I didn't even want to see his face. This was the same face that had betrayed me. If anything, I wanted to leave this school so that I didn't have to see him again. But I didn't have the luxury to take that road. I decided avoiding him would be a better idea. But please, Ronnie, talk to me. Let me explain. Go to hell, I replied, and grabbed the keys. I need to go home. Can I drive you to your home? He sounded desperate. I'd rather kill myself, George. When I pushed at his shoulder, he stumbled back and stood out of my way. I do not want to see you, honestly. You've just made my life a living hell. I'm not all bad, Ronnie, he begged behind me. I didn't turn around when I spoke next. You've done a brilliant job at proving to me that, George. Congratulations. I hope he was smart enough to understand the sarcasm. But Ronnie... I clicked my tongue and walked out of the hallway. Go to hell, George. Enough of him. Later that evening. It sucks to know George, I muttered to myself. I had burnt my dinner. This was twice in a row. I sighed and stared at the poor excuse of dinner and wondered what the hell was I supposed to eat now? I was out of everything. There was barely anything left in the fridge. If it wasn't for me thinking about that guy, this wouldn't have happened. It sucked that the more I decided I didn't want to think about him, the more I did. But now that I had seen him, I couldn't help but draw a connection between his arrival and the student gossip I have overheard during my duty. I had heard some students discussing the arrival of a new teacher in the school a few days back. The last name sounded familiar to me but believing that there was a good chance it was some other Johnson, I didn't pay it any mind. But now that I'd finally seen George's face, I wasn't sure if that had been a good idea. I wasn't sure what I would have done had I known, but it would have helped me better prepare for him because I knew somehow that he would come to find me if he could. After that entire fiasco with his dad, George hadn't contacted me once. He had left no messages and no calls. On the day I was to leave, my dad had handed me a small note. He said he found it outside our house. One look at the writing, and I knew it was from George. It simply read, I am sorry, Ronnie. I hope you can forgive me for everything. I'd crumbled the note and thrown it in the dustbin. That was the last of him that I'd known. After all this time, he was back. When the smell of the burnt dinner got overpowering, I threw it all away and grabbed my wallet. I could do with a butter sandwich today. I wasn't in the mood to cook anymore. But was it a bad decision? Of course it was a bad decision. I was rifling through a vast selection of yogurt when I noticed his reflection standing right behind me. I sighed. So much for getting bread and yogurt. I randomly picked one tube and turned around to find him standing there, looking a tad bit nervous and flushed. Hey, he said. Didn't think I'd see you here. I walked past him and stood in the huge line leading up to the counter. It was past nine and people were still out and about. What was wrong with the world? Go off, I replied. Ronnie. I want you to know I didn't follow you. I had to buy some kitchen stuff, and I saw you there. How are you, Ronnie? He sounded nervous still. I wondered if it was something he displayed only in front of me. I'd seen him interacting with the students and the other staff at school. He seemed pretty chill and confident with them. If our past made him feel so much guilt that he felt nervous around me, then that sounded good to my ears. He better be nervous. 
Leave me alone, George. I am not in the mood. Ronnie, I am sorry for everything, he said for the nth time. By now, he sounded like an annoying mosquito that just wouldn't leave your side until you killed it. I wonder if I could kill George without earning a sentence. Getting a sentence for killing him would kind of kill the purpose. When my turn came, I immediately grabbed my items, paid for the two items, and hurried the hell out of there. The more I stayed around him, the more I was reminded of the times that I didn't want to remember. But he didn't look like he was done. Ronnie, he said rushing towards me with his bag of groceries. When I didn't stop, he grabbed my hand and pulled me close as if we were protagonists of some darn romantic drama. I tried to pull my hand free, but he was too damn strong for his own good. Just listen to me once, alright? After that, if you want me to leave, I will leave. The offer was good, and I kind of wanted to know why he was so persistent in his approach. Shouldn't he hide from me lest I tell everyone of his secret? Did anyone know he was gay? Did they care as much as his dad did? Bark, I replied, and that was how I found myself walking next to him on that gloomy late evening. By the time we reached a quieter street, he looked a little constipated. Considering his frame and height, it didn't really suit him. Ronnie, I know nothing that I say will make it better, he began, but I want to tell you that if I had even a little control over that situation, I would have saved you. You didn't say a word, I replied. I know, he replied, a little desperately now, and I have never regretted anything more in my life. I know it doesn't warrant any sympathy from you, but I have lived in shame for what I didn't do. He sighed and offered me a hand as if I were going to take it. I looked at it for a second before I looked away. I wasn't sure what he wanted from me. I have loathed myself ever since that day, Ronnie. I have lived in great burden ever since I realized I hurt the only person I ever came to truly love. Why was he talking like that? It made sense. He was a literature teacher. I had heard from one of the staff members earlier in the day that they had come to like George instantly, given his intelligence, kindly voice, and handsome looks. But his confession meant little to me at this moment. It was I who had confessed my love to him all those years ago. He hadn't replied then, so what did he mean by admitting that now? I wanted to hurt him. I wanted to punch him in the face and make him feel even an ounce of the pain that he made me feel then. Your dad wanted to file a case against me, George. To my horror, my eyes were suddenly filled with tears and my face was flushed red. Also, my voice wavered with each word I spoke. I didn't want to be around him anymore. He wanted to file sexual misconduct charges against me. He was ready to ruin my life just because we kissed. You didn't say anything. He lowered his head in shame. I did what I could do, Ronnie. I couldn't help but scoff in reply. I am sure. Ronnie, I know this doesn't mean anything, and I do not take credit for anything, but... It was only because I begged my dad to not file that case that he left you alone. What? He nodded. When I asked him to do that, he warned me not to contact you at all. He deleted all your contacts from my phone, he blocked you, and he asked me to remove all my accounts from social media. That was why I left that little note for you. Had I contacted you, Ronnie, he would have done something stupid. He shook his head. I hoped you'd contact me in any way, but I understood why you didn't. I hadn't known that in my head. I'd only remembered George as the guy who'd left me to deal with the absolute worst kind of homophobia all alone. I had spent my first year crying each night because he had set such a bad standard for a relationship. Ever since that day, Ronnie, I have looked for you everywhere. 
you should have said something. I know, he easily agreed. It was the least I could do to salvage everything. I was young and foolish. I wasn't sure of my sexuality. I was afraid of my dad and I didn't say anything. Ronnie, he stopped and turned to me and held my hand as if I'd given him the permission to. Ronnie, give me a chance. I want to make every wrong right. I will tend to all your pains. Please, Ronnie. Sleep didn't come easy that night. A few days later. It was Friday. I was back on my duty. Almost all the students were out of the building, except those who had to stay back for their club duties. But they were to leave soon anyway. I expected everyone else to be out. So I imagine my surprise when I entered the conference room only to find George sitting on one of the desks and hurriedly typing on his laptop. I switched on the lights in the room and he looked up. He didn't say anything and he returned to his work. Although this time he looked less focused. The evening we met, I asked him not to talk to me. I had asked for some space and he dutifully accepted my request. Since then, although I often felt his eyes on me, he never really approached me, unless it was necessary. In a way, I was glad. In a way, I was upset. Most of the anger I felt for George was for his silence. He hadn't said a word. Maybe his speaking up wouldn't have changed much. Maybe it would have made things worse. But at least, I would have been sure that I wasn't left all alone. At that time, I needed that reassurance. But now that I knew he had done his part, I was doubtful. I was in conflict. Could I stay upset at him now that I knew he had saved my life in a way? Sean was an absolute crazy man. Although he was respected in the town as its sheriff, each one of the townspeople was aware of the strict ways he conducted his own family. His family members dressed a certain way, and they were the only ones to attend all masses of the month. If someone found them funny, they only laughed behind their backs. So I understood the real villain in my story was Sean, and not George. And that was why I was so conflicted. George had been young at the time, younger than me in fact. Did it make sense that my anger towards him seemed to fizzle out now that I knew he wasn't anything like his dad? He had a genteel nature, and his mannerisms were still as soft as they had been then. Heck, even though he was as tall and as broad as his dad, he didn't scare me. He didn't seem like a man who'd use such assets to impose himself on others and perhaps these qualities helped me distinguish him from his dad. Why are you still here, I asked, cleaning the board. I could feel his eyes on my back, but I tried my best to not turn around and look back. I wasn't sure how I would react then. Got some work to finish, she answered. New teachers get the most work, they said. They do, I replied. I have often seen them more stressed out than final year students. George gave a small, soft laugh. I can relate, honestly. I didn't reply and returned to my work. His nervousness was palpable. I knew even before he opened his mouth that he was going to say something. Ronnie, did you drop your studies? I sighed. There it was, the question of the century. I had no other option. I picked up a feather duster and returned to my work. After everything, I had to drop my studies in the middle, thanks to your dad. When I came to the city, I had little money on me, only enough to survive. I didn't think it was worth investing in studies, especially when I knew I couldn't afford any course. I was bearing my soul to him. Why was I doing it? I didn't owe him any answer. Maybe I lied to myself. I just wanted to make him feel guilty. Then I got a job here and, well, I'm still stuck here. I'm sorry, George replied, and he sounded just as mournful and guilty as I expected he would. Ronnie, if there's any way I can help. For some reason, his remorseful tone and shame seemed to unnerve me. It would have been better had he been like his dad. 
At least I would have known how to handle myself around him. I settled for the easiest reply I could gather. You cannot do shit, so shut up. He went mum. Throughout the time I stayed in that conference room, I didn't hear him type once. It was almost like he was lost in thought or guilt. Whatever it was, I didn't care. I just hoped sleep would be difficult for him tonight. When I was nearly out, he called out to me. Ronnie, maybe I can help you find a good course for something you'd like. Do you still like dancing? I remember you were such a beautiful dancer. Tears blurred my vision. How dare he, I thought to myself. Thanks for reminding me I can't afford good shit, George. Long after I'd left, I could hear the apologetic tone in the single word he let out. Ronnie. A few days later. George was feeling sorry and ashamed. Each day, I found a new note in my locker. Each note contained a lengthy apology. As I read through each verbose, I couldn't help but find a glimpse of that younger George that I'd come to love. This time, Instead of crumbling his notes, I folded each one neatly and put them in my wallet. Maybe one day, I would have the heart to read through them without tearing up. The weather in recent times had gotten worse, and the result of it was the fever that I gained in the middle of my duty. I had been sickly throughout the day, but the fever only came in the evening. Almost all the staff was already out of the building, so I wasn't sure whose help I could ask for. As I tried to finish through my work, all the while making sure I wasn't contaminating anything, I could feel the dizzy spells. When I realized that I couldn't move on anymore, I checked my watch and realized it was past 8. If I was lucky, I would find George hovering over his laptop in the conference room. It wasn't the ideal option, but I couldn't think of anything else to save my life. I dragged myself up the flight of stairs and fell down on the doorway of the conference room. I heard a screech and couldn't help but chuckle a little in amusement. The room was bathed in dark. No wonder I'd freaked him out. Who's that? Ronnie? Is that you? Yes, I replied. Oh, my god. Ronnie, are you alright? He came rushing over to me and immediately gathered me in his arms. Shit, you have a fever. Can you please bring me home? I asked. Getting straight to the point. I just hoped my words were clear enough so that he could understand them. I need some sleep. Of course. Wait. He stopped and touched my forehead. You're burning. Wait here a moment. He rushed in, grabbed his items, helped me to my feet, and grabbed me around my waist before dragging us both out of there. I am sorry, George. I am being troublesome. Hush now, Ronnie. You're anything but troublesome. The next day. The next time I woke up, it was morning. My body was still aching, but it was a dull ache. I must have taken some pills yesterday. I sighed and returned to my sleep, and would have been sleeping through the dull ache if not for the little rustle I heard at the foot of the bed. Immediately thinking that it was a ghost, I woke up with a scream. It was not a ghost. It was worse. It was George. Sorry for waking you up, he whispered. He sounded guilty. What are you doing here? I stopped to take a proper look at where I was. This place definitely did not look like something that I could afford. The walls were stark white but I could see the expensive decorations hanging off of them. I was sure one of the flower pots at the corner of the room was gold-plated. It was shining under the sunlight. This was not my home. Where am I? What am I doing here? You're at my place, George answered and raised his hands in surrender. You were sick last evening, and you asked me to bring you home. I brought you in my car, but... You were long asleep before I could ask you for your address. I didn't want to disturb you, so I brought you here. I remembered most of what he said. And don't worry, I slept in the other room. Thanks, I replied, 
my voice a lot softer than I intended. I was glad for his kindness, but I wasn't sure any of my words could help relay that message. Thanks for last night. He softly smiled, and it seemed to reach his eyes. You're welcome, Ronnie. Would you like some soup? I was inexplicably feeling shy. I think I should return home. I will drop you off, he promised, but eat something first. I let out the easiest word I could think of at the moment. Okay. A few days later, I knew a few people who knew of my story were upset at the development, but the truth was that I didn't really feel any resentment or anger towards George, at least not with the intensity that I did weeks earlier. At some point, I felt that I didn't need to even explain. If things worked out well between George and me, good. If they didn't, good. Following my sickness, it turned out that I had infected George as well. When he was younger, he had a poor constitution, although I wasn't aware of what he was like now. I could say that it didn't really come out as a surprise to me when I heard him sneezing in the conference room. i just finished my morning duties, and I heard him sneezing several times on his way towards the conference room. It was a good thing that I had a half day, because when I asked if George wanted a cup of coffee, he said that he was planning to visit the local coffee shop. And God knew what the hell was wrong with me. I informed him about my half day today, and he asked if I wanted to come along. There went all my hopes to hold bad feelings for him. When we reached the shop, he held the door open for me. Because he was sick, I asked him what he wanted to drink and then asked him to grab a seat for us. This behavior of his was so very similar to what he had been before. Each time he did something nice for me, I was immediately reminded of something similar happening in the past. This, I believed, helped me reconcile with him. I believe it's because of me, I began and handed him his cup. I think I'd had a little too much sweet, he replied. You've still got a sweet tooth. Cannot help it. He smiled and let out a small, ah, when he finally took a warm sip of his coffee. I mirrored his expression because I had just been getting better after my fever. I didn't know what to talk about. I had a bunch of questions, but they all sounded intrusive in my head. At last, when the awkwardness got a little too much for me, I asked the first question that popped into my head. I believed that was a good enough question. How's your experience here, George? He gave a small laugh. Ronnie, I know that's not what you want to ask. What is it that's bothering you? His fingers currently splayed out on the table, very close to me. You can ask me anything. I want to give you answers, Ronnie. Each time he said my name, I strangely felt loved. I wasn't apologetic when I asked him about his dad. My tone was bitter and there was an undeniable viciousness to it. And although I was glad that George had proven he wasn't like his dad, I couldn't help but ask painful things. I remembered him telling me that his dad would pass away soon. Why? If my assumptions were correct, he should still be in his late 50s to early 60s. Is your dad still alive? His reply was kind. Unfortunately, yes. Trust me when I say, it's not a wonderful life that he's living right now. Why? What happened? I wasn't curious, I just wanted to rejoice in his pain. Sean had done enough damage to me, and I wasn't ashamed to admit that I wanted to see him hurt on as many occasions as possible. He has got anal cancer, George replied, a wry smile on his face. That's very ironic, I replied a little shocked and a little surprised at the news. From what I remembered of Sean, he was a pretty healthy man. I'm sorry, I do not feel any sympathy for him. And I understand that, Ronnie. He deserves this. How are you holding up? Was it wrong to want him to be alright? In recent times, and especially after his confession, my feelings 
had undeniably softened for him. Never been better, George replied, and somehow I knew he meant that because of me. It was an extraordinary feeling. Just before we parted, I couldn't help but ask if he was dating someone. The realization of what I'd asked came a little slowly to me, and my cheeks reddened with shame. Perfectly single, he replied. I'm sure you'd find a nice guy. Does your dad know? He shrugged. I intend for him to find that out soon. He ran a hand through his hair and looked down at me. Are you dating someone, Ronnie? Why did he have to repeat my name so often? No, I shook my head. Something akin to relief washed his handsome face. Ronnie, um, I'm not dating anyone either. I understood the emphasis. All right. I'll wait for you, he said, whenever you're ready. Taking a half day meant extra work on the following day, so it wasn't a surprise to me when I was held back for several hours because of the students, as usual, had made a mess after a party they'd just thrown for a teacher's birthday. My idea of the evening was to just finish the work in silence, as I always did, and return home, as I always did. But the universe wasn't on my side. It was past eight, and the rowdy students that I heard giggling at the corner of the room shouldn't be there. Technically, I could inform the guard and then they could take the final measure, but the work was heavy and I believed I could always finish the work first and inform the guard on my way out. How were they allowed here in the first place? Wasn't there a protocol at the school? Where were their parents? But my earlier decision to inform the guard later was a wrong decision. I could have done better. It started with the students loudly giggling and throwing paper scraps all over the floor. When I asked them to shut it, they replied that they always knew that I was the school's sleazy janitor. Before you say anything, I must tell you that I'll inform the principal of your words. What year are you in? Waiting for us to turn legal, fag? There it was. This was the thing I hated the most. Being out in front of a bunch of hormonal kids never ended up nicely for me. And if it wasn't for Dusty, the guy who worked in the washrooms, none of the students and the faculty members would have known of me being gay. There was a reason I'd stayed silent about this. Shut the fuck up, I screeched. I'll inform the principal. Instead of taking the cue to leave, they started ganging up on me. I knew I couldn't touch or hurt them, so I decided to seek the guard instead. Perhaps he would know how to handle this situation. But before I could move, one of the boys shoved at my back. Had I not extended my hand against the door, I would have broken my nose. This is why I hated working at the school. I was at the bottom of the list and was treated as such. Although, the principal took this situation very seriously. I couldn't deny that I had often asked them to take extra measures regarding their students' behavior. We were loud, so there was a good chance that someone had hurt us. I expected a guard to rush in to check on the commotion, but it was, well, George. Had he still not finished with his responsibilities as the new teacher? God, was he slow. Hey, cut it out. George grabbed my arm and pulled me behind himself. I was a little dizzy, and again, felt that familiar but annoying buzz of feverish feeling on my skin. Why are you all here? Give me your names right now. But I was annoyed and upset, so I didn't wait to see what he would do. I grabbed my stuff, locked it all in the closet, and rushed out of there. The shame of being caught in such a position was not easy to bear. But the walk to the bus stop was 10 minutes, and I was sure I couldn't walk. I had an oncoming headache, so when George came rushing after me some moments later and asked if he could drop me at my home, I pushed at his shoulder. Stay away, George, I said. Ronnie, he replied in that soft voice that he always seemed to use with me. Let me help you. He gently grabbed my hand, and I could feel the familiar buzz of warmth on my skin. It was so nice to have him around sometimes, although sometimes 
I couldn't stand the sight of him to save my life. George, I said. Please. But that wasn't the only time he had come to help me. In the following days when I finally dared to return to school after the principal promised that he'd look into the matter, George greeted me with a warm cup of coffee. When I checked my closet, I found a little receipt and an acceptance letter? What the hell? It belonged to a small dance academy that I often saw during commuting. Although I could barely contain my excitement, I couldn't deny the burning shame that crept under my skin. Had George been behind this? Why did he do it? When I found him, he was busy in class. I stood waiting outside his class for the next 25 minutes and when he finally walked out, I asked if I could talk to him. He looked nervous but agreed. What is this, George? You like dancing, he replied. So am I a charity case to you? I didn't actually feel like it, but I had to show my anger in some ways. I didn't mind that this would mean I'd get to go to the academy, but I wanted George to speak up. What are you expecting from me, George? Nothing, Ronnie. I expect nothing. And he sounded sincere. I just want to see you happy. I still remember how happy you looked each time you danced, and I don't want you to stop, Ronnie. I don't want the past to be the reason for you to give up on your dreams. Is it only because you feel guilty? It's because I love you. His confession was soft and sincere. He meant it, and he wouldn't look away from me. I've loved you ever since I first saw you all those years ago. I loved you when we kissed, and I have loved you even harder after I wronged you. He sucked on his bottom lip. It may have started with guilt, yes, but that is not all. You are free to accept me or refuse me, but I will show my love to you until you ask me to leave. I sighed and looked down at the acceptance letter. It wasn't a huge academy and the classes would first start with basics. And I wanted to dance. Do you want me to leave you alone, Ronnie? I sighed again. Fuck no. Was I still angry at him? I wasn't sure. But was I glad that he had returned? I was now. Now, I was glad. He gave a small smile. Thank you, Ronnie. He pointed at the letter. And they're good people. I met them. They speak nicely. Some time later. George and I first kissed on the first day I attended the dance class. I had just walked out of the academy, flushed and happy. And he had been waiting, leaning against his car. It was a Saturday, so his presence made sense. But when he waved at me, I felt a wave of nostalgia that I just couldn't recover from. As I slowly walked towards him, and he began asking if my first class was nice, I couldn't help but hug him and kiss him. It was then I'd realized I'd forgiven him. George looked happier than me, and I could feel it in the kiss we shared. The same evening, he asked if I wanted to meet his dad. It was after that question that George and I walked into his home in the town. That dirtbag Sean had been lying on his bed when we entered his room, and, for the slightest moment, I wanted to ask if he was dying well. It sounded like a good question to me. A few days ago, George had removed his shirt and shown me the cigarette mark Sean had left on his shoulder. George said he had done it soon after he found us kissing, and almost every other day just to remind him that he needed to stay in the damn line. Now we'd return to this hellhole. When Sean found me standing next to his son, his eyes hardened. Why are you back here, fag? Dad, George replied, and held my hand right in front of him. He's my boyfriend. I'm gay. Hell, you're not. He tried to sit up, but couldn't. I watched him struggle with delight. 
Get away from my son, he seethed. What are you going to do if I did not, Sean? Before he could answer, George spoke up. I do not know about him, but I know what I would do to prove that I am gay, Dad. He turned to me and with one full sweep pressed a kiss against my mouth. Sean, for his part, screamed with rage. He was so loud that had anyone listened, they would have thought he was getting murdered. No son of mine could be gay. But he is, I replied, a sick satisfaction burning under my skin. Dad, I added. Mocking lit in my tone, George held my hand tighter. George and I were not perfect creatures, and I was ready to live with that knowledge. Sean was still alive when George and I announced our relationship to my dad and, by stretch, to the townspeople. He never came out to greet us, and never even opened the door for us, but that was all well. When he died, George and I didn't attend. As for George and me, we were working on our relationship. I couldn't say that I'd gotten over everything that had happened in the past, so George and I were busy making sure it wouldn't hurt us. I left my janitor's job and focused more on my dance classes. In the next two months, I started working at the local flower shop. The End What would you do if you were in Ronnie's place? Would you give George another chance? Thanks for watching! Consider subscribing to become part of our Rainbow Force and to stay wholesome.